And I have a couple of things I wanted to talk about. One of them is uh, the money from Legacy Farms that comes in on that school, that $500,000 check, are we now able to take, take that and put it in our account and have we done so? Mr. Kamala. It's been done. Town, town meeting approved the process for doing so. I would like to check with the accounting department as to whether the money has actually been moved to the new account or not. Okay, thank you. You get back to us sometime yes. next week? I could do that right now. I can send them an email. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The second thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the center school. At the town meeting, we appropriated some money to do some planning and estimating and moving forward. And I know that the pin, the point who's driving this is probably the, the town engineer who's out on a leave. I just didn't want this to go on any longer because I'm wondering if there's any um, moves forward as far as using that money that was appropriated at the town meeting to move this forward so that we can see what's going to happen in the near future. And, have somebody stay on it on a daily or a weekly basis because I was here two years ago with the same situation and it was one of those things where nobody could believe that it wasn't going to be all taken care of by the next winter and I can see this trial I can see that school being big in another winter at the snail's pace that it's going right now does anybody know anything about this through the chair quick updates um, the school is not entirely vacant. There are portions of the school that are used by Park and Rec, and we have had inquiries also from groups that have uh, used the facility over the years, uh, and we're considering those options. In terms of the permanent building committee's work, mm -hmm. my understanding is that they already have been enga engaged uh, an architect who's uh, conducting the feasibility study. They've done some of the preliminary work. I've seen some preliminary thoughts between going on between the permanent building committee and the architect. They are also thinking of bringing in a detailed cost estimator so that at least when the recommendations come forth before the board, they can advise the board on the detailed cost estimates of the project and the associated options. Thank you. The first part that you answered as far as whether somebody's in there now, that wasn't any of my concern. My concern is the finalized product. We want to get it moving. And um, the, say the PBC has uh, already engaged a, a, a consultant or an engineer to plan it. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Now, let me ask you, have they had any meetings? Because I haven't seen any meetings posted with their committee from this town meeting. So how can they have a meeting and hire somebody to vote to do this if they don't hold a meeting? Because I, I plan on going to all their meetings and they never meet. Yeah. You're on that meeting. You were one of the members of that, y by the way. Y yes. Um, the town has great volunteer teams. The permanent building committee, um, similar to what other town committees do, uh, they can enter into agreements with consultants subject to town meeting approval. So this was already in the works. That doesn't have any, they're not, they're not under the jurisdiction of the uh, open meeting laws. They don't have to have open meetings. Uh, like They can talk over the phone, two or three of them. Is that how that goes? No, that's not how that goes. How can that they meeting is my question. Okay, we, we, can, we can discuss this offline. They did meet, they discussed the options, they discussed engaging and consultant in open meetings. Uh, and I actually tried to reach Dan McIntyre late last week uh, and, and I'll follow up with him regarding when their next scheduled meeting is. <coughs> I feel like Joe Regan when he was talking about last year and the year before when he tried to get somebody to come in and buy a bucket truck. I guess I'm going to have to keep coming back. But thank you all. We got the bucket truck. We're going to get it, though. Yeah, but you haven't got any accessories to go with it. Uh, no. <laughs> well, good night. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Terry. Is there anyone else?
Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. My name is Beth Malloy, 190 Lumber Street. I am the recently elected chair of the Affordable Housing Fund Committee. Um, one of the items that we discussed in our last meeting was that we would like to change the bylaw to add two more members to our committee. I see us in the next few years really changing the way our committee has been working. Um, we have a planning board that's behind us. We have some money in the bank. We have Paul Mastriani willing to be our guinea pig as far as um, when he he has his development he wants to put in uh, on Chamberlain Street and we worked it out that he's going to be buying us three units outside of the development and this is something that the town has never done before um, we're really excited about it we want to see more of this um, from fu future developers instead of the payout which has been happening um, so I wanted to come and let you know what's happening in our committee. Um, I'm hoping to get some more training because we're still a little green around the gills. Um, but I also wanted to get your opinion on us going ahead and at the ATM 2020 uh, getting two more members on our board. Mr. Kamala, do we have to wait till ATM 2020 to add uh, members to their board or is that charter related or? or? Yeah. Um, respectfully through the board, I'd suggest that uh, I can thank you, Beth Malloy, for the work that you're doing with the committee. Thank you for moving this project forward. I suggest that perhaps you touch base with Elaine and I will work on drafting the proposed changes, circulate them to relevant parties in town, and then together with you bring them to the board. That's great. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. And I also wanted to let you know that we'll be asking the planning board pretty much moving forward to give us the units as opposed to the buyouts. Okay. Yeah. Yes, again, the target being the next scheduled annual town meeting. Okay. For the changes. All right, awesome. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes? Um, I attended the um, Affordable Housing Committee meeting, and um, one thing that we also came to realize is that, uh, it's that we, we don't have enough members in the committee right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's currently posted at the, that there are four members, but it's supposed to be five. Apparently, you're the fifth. I'm a liaison. You're a full member. Okay. Which means you okay. come towards the quorum. Yeah, we're learning. Okay. Um, I didn't think you did either, but apparently you do. Okay. You're a voting member as well. Okay. Uh, through the chair, I'm just I'm glad that this uh, this uh, group is meeting <clears throat> because I guess for the last six or seven years it's there hasn't been a meeting at all, and it's very uh, it's a needed a commodity in town is to have some affordable housing. So. I came before you two years ago and said, I'm not putting my name back on this unless this yeah. something happens here. So something's happening, and I'm really Good. excited about it. Thanks for doing it. All righty. Good. Anyone else? Public, public uh, comment? Public uh, oh. Go ahead. Mary Jo. I, I just wanted to speak to that for just a minute. I'm very glad that we have the Affordable Housing Committee, and, but I'm looking at he wants Mr. Mastriani wants to give three units outside of his development, and now we're having a problem with getting units outside of the Legacy Farms development, from what I understand, going to some planning board meetings. What sort of outside affordable housing are you looking at to buy? Right now, we're looking for single-family homes to offer to some of the renters in our towns, uh, you know, first-time home, first home buyers. Um, and I think with the money that we possibly will be getting from the 18 units, that will allow us as well to purchase some units. Within that complex? Uh, nope. No. We're going to, we'll, here's no. our goal, is let's not put all our affordable housing in one area. Let's right. put them throughout the town and incorporate them, you know, into our neighborhood as they should be. So that's, that's what I see for our future. And with the payouts and the money that we're sitting on, um, after we go through this with Mr. Mastriani, we'll be able to go forward on our own. Yeah, through the chair, to, to, to uh, Mary Jo's point, yeah, that, was one of the, that was one of the things we voted at a town meeting. If 46 had passed, then that may have been able to happen, but since it's just, it's just the 47. 
Right. That's a 37. Uh, it was the, this 36, 37, 46, and 47. And, um, but one of, the th one of the problems that we have in town is that we are a uh, community that, that has high home prices. And, and to try and find houses that fit in that um, price range in order to be considered affordable, uh, the developers really have to take a loss in order to build them and, and, uh, and, and move them. And I think that's one of the difficulties sometimes. It is, and again, it's, it's a new territory, and Hopkinton is a town where people want to live, so if you want to build 30 houses, some will be willing to take the risk and go ahead and, and go forward with it. Um, some may give us an upfront buyout, which would leave us an opportunity to mix our money together and go out and buy some of these homes that are, you know, three, four, under 500, um, and they're, they're out there. They're out there. All right. All set? Sounds Thank good. You. Thank, All right. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is the consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items are number one, approve the May 28 minutes. Number two, accept a $100 donation to the library gift fund from the Trails Club. Number three, accept a $175 donation to the Veterans Celebration Committee from Reverend Cannon, Pastor of St. John's, to help defray costs of Memorial Day ceremonies and Veterans Day dinner. Would any member like to break out the items into a separate vote? Okay, hearing none, I will request a motion to approve the consent agenda items. So moved. Second. Okay, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All against? Okay, passes. Library Foundation donation. The board will consider donating, accepting a donation of $436,606, which is equivalent to the fiscal year 20 debt service for the public library project. The gift is from the Hopkins Library, Hopkins Public Library Foundation, Laura Barry to present the gift. Uh, the fiscal year 20 budget approved at town meeting incorporates this donation as a funding source to the library debt service. Ms. Barry, how are you? Great, how are you? Good I evening. Am great. Good it's evening. good to see you. It's always good to see you up here. You're always up here for good reasons. Thank you. We Thank like you. to see you. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Amanda Lasada. Hi, Amanda. How are you? She's Welcome. also on the foundation board and has been an integral member in, in helping us our fundraising. Um, as you heard, we are here to um, deliver a contribution to the town. Um, as many of you know, we, um, the Hopkinton Public Library Foundation was started back in 2011 with the primary mission to advocate for and raise private funds for the renovation expansion of Hopkinton Public Library. We were very successful with those efforts and the library has been open now close to two years. Um, we were also very successful with our fundraising. We met and exceeded our goal of raising um, $1 million. And what we have done, um, which I think has worked out great for the town, is um, paid uh, with last year, as well as this year, the amount equivalent to the library debt service. Um, so this year we are delivering um, a contribution in the amount of 436606 dollars uh, with the contribution for FY for last year's fiscal year of it's fiscal year 20 yep so last year FY 2019 was four hundred and forty three thousand nine hundred and fifty six dollars for a total now contributed contributed of eight hundred and eighty thousand five hundred and sixty two for the library. That is awesome. That is yes, incredible. Yes, we're very excited. We're incredible. very happy to do it. And um, I thought it was going to be one of those big foam. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't fit in my car. <laughs> it's still good. It's um, awesome. We understand from the library, as you guys also get frequent updates, that the library has been very vibrant, um, very well used, with um, lots of activities throughout the week and throughout the year so I think it's all been a success all around um, with our contribution and with the state grant of four and a half million uh, brought the cost of the renovation down for the town down to five point six point two million dollars unbelievable that's great uh, so as a elected member of the town I would like to say from the town thank you thank you very much it's wonderful to see people in town doing the work that you're doing and, and it's appreciated and, and I know you're, you're not in it for people that walk around and come up to you and say thank you but I'm speaking for the town I'm going to say thank you very much for doing that it's a it's a wonderful thing that you're doing and we very much appreciate it uh, that said I'll open it up to the board Mr. Nasrullah 
Yeah, I got to say, when I when I read this uh, agenda and how much we're getting, I'm, I, it, it took a while to close my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> my jaw hit the floor. Uh, it's incredible that you're able to raise so much funds and do so much for the town. Um, I mean, this is strictly volunteer, and, and the fact that you're doing this for the betterment of, of my children, all our children, um, as well as us, it's, it's incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we really, really appreciate your efforts, everything you do. Mr. Coutinho. Actually, I've used this, this term be before. It, there's an ancient uh, Aramaic term called dayenu, which means it would have sufficed. It would have sufficed if we just had a great library. You know, and, but um, to have everybody in the town, many people in the town contribute to it, to, to um, uh, with all the fundraising, and, and for, for, for you and your team to do all that fundraising, it's wonderful, because we've had other groups come before us and say, we're gonna do fundraising, we're gonna do fundraising, and nothing ever happened. But um, to see the, the, the checks actually coming in, so that uh, people understand that when, when groups say that they're going to do fundraising and they're going to get stuff done, that certain <coughs> groups really do do it. And it's very much appreciated. And thank you for, for a crown jewel in our downtown. It's wonderful. Mary Jo? I just want to say thank you very, very much. Um, and I have one question, and it's not, it's not actually for you. I think it's for Norman through the chair uh, about the library have we, and with all this contributions and donations, I understand that originally there was to be a railway in the front of the library where it comes down like that, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of a railing and it is not there and I heard that the, it probably wasn't going to be there and I am really, uh, I've tried it <laughs> and I'm scared myself, so I don't know how little children or, or a, a woman with a baby carriage is going to feel about it. I think, it's, uh, I think we do need that one reel. Yeah, through, through the chair, my understanding is that the issue has been brought to the Permanent Building Committee's attention and uh, the Director of Library Services may have um, much more up-to-date information. So with the chair's permission, um, it is here to expand on the point. Sorry, I didn't mean I was heartfelt okay. thanks for the, uh, the money, but the, it, it's an issue that bothers me. Sure, yeah, I, I'm just I'm going to speak into the mic because I know that there are people listening on HCAM. Um, yes, this is something that, that we've heard something about. Um, there was a PBC vote on the matter, and then in construction, sometimes some things. It's a large project. Um, it's something that we are going back to. I'm talking with facilities about it. Um, it will require, I believe, going back to the Historic District Commission, so that will be a process, but it's a process we're working on because we have heard okay. about it. Thank you. That's great. All right, so uh, I will take a motion on this. Uh, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make a motion to accept the donation of $436,606 from the Hopkins Public Library Foundation. A second. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Looks like it carries. Looks like we will accept your gift. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just pass it over this way? Yes. Awesome. Thanks again. You're welcome. All right, uh, staff appointments. The select board will affirm the town manager's appointment of Andrea Conboy as Hopkins Public Library Chairman, uh, Children's Librarian, and Michael Connolly as Town Treasurer Collector until July 19th of 2019. Mr. Kamala, would yes, you uh, introduce? Yes, through, through the chair, I am very excited uh, to uh, present oh. Uh, Andrea Conboy is the town's uh, children's librarian. Uh, and tonight, I'm through, with your permission, I'm going to ask Heather Beckman to speak to uh, Andrea's background. Absolutely, Heather. Certainly. Well, it's, you might as well just call it the Library Select Board meeting. Yep. <laughs> um, yes, I am very, very pleased to be able to introduce Andrea to you 
this evening. Um, she has a master's degree in speech language pathology as well as some years of work experience in that field working with children which gives her a unique background in early literacy development um, which is certainly valuable as we strive to support the education of our young people. She's also in the process of completing her master's degree in library science from Simmons University. And she's been with us for a year as a substitute librarian. So we've had the opportunity to get to know her. Um, and we really love her and have enjoyed working with her. I am truly delighted to bring her on board as a children's librarian. I think she's going to accomplish great things for the library and for the town um, and really connect with the patrons. Um, I, throughout the interview process, everybody who interviewed her Again, was very, very impressed with her presentation, her skill set, um, and we're just thrilled to bring her on board. We think that she's going to be a great addition to our team. Yes, welcome. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So let me welcome, be one of the first ones to welcome you to the town of Hopkinton and to our beautiful new library. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to us? Um, I am just so excited for this opportunity um, and I truly enjoy working with kids um, and I've worked with kids for quite a while um, and I'm just really excited to um, continue the excellence that's already exists at the library um, and to bring new programs um, as well as continue the old ones so thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with Mary Jo. Your, your resume is outstanding so <laughs> I read every word of it. I have one question. Are you a local person? Um, I reside in Ashland. Okay. You know. Okay. I just I, there was a, a Nancy Convoy that I worked with at the Department of Higher Ed when I was in the Senate and uh, the Senator Mignani, and I was well, the convoy is not a very not common, a common name. name yeah. So I'll ask my husband. <laughs> huh? I thought you might be related. Um, no, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful resume. Uh, just off the top, but you're going to be the children's librarian. What kind of children's programs do you think you might want to initiate? And we've had Story Hour and, you know, a lot of programs over the years, and I was just wondering what would, what would you continue? What would you like? Yeah, um, so I think the um, preschool story time is definitely something we, of course, want to continue. We have really great attendance for that. Um, we do have kind of a lap sit program for toddlers um, about once a month, but I like to see us increase that to maybe um, bi-weekly or every week because um, I think that's really important for development. Um, but I'd like to see an increase <clears throat> in our programming for kids um, K to five. Um, I'd really like to reach out to the teachers in the community and um, really get a, a broad overview of the curriculum so that I can design programming that aligns with the curriculum um, and offers the students or the, the patrons opportunity to generalize what they're learning in schools to another setting or to explore literature that's related to what they're learning in school, but also literature that they're interested outside of school as well. So I'd like to increase some programming for that age range as well. Thank you. I, I just think your resume is fabulous and that uh, I have every faith in you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hearing what you're saying and uh, I love the idea of the children's library, so. Me too. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Mr. Catino. Uh, welcome. And I don't want to say welcome, you've already been here, but you know, I, I just love the fact that we, that we now have a, not saying we hadn't, but a 21st century librarian to go with our 21st century library. You know, seeing, that, seeing your experience at Raytheon and, and that, that whole higher level of, of utilizing uh, electronics also and um, you know, helping not, not just, the, not just the, the children, but even the adults that might need to come in or the seniors that come in may, might need help um, researching stuff or even just getting on Google. So it's just great to see all that and thanks for um, sticking with us and uh, you know, going through the, the earlier uh, job and, and now doing this permanent one. Thank Welcome. You. I truly enjoyed working here, so um, I'm glad that I get to work here full time now. <laughs> Excellent, us too. Mr. Nasrullah. Yeah, and looking, I mean, looking over your resume, I'm, I'm sure we have the right person. <laughs> it's, um, it's incredible uh, what you've been able to do in such a short time, and um, I'm so proud that you've chosen our town 
to uh, to you know avail your services. Um, the speech pathology, uh, having having gone through this with my own child, um, and, and see, seeing how that can relate to other issues, is uh, incredibly important. And I, I'm blown away that you know we have someone in, in town now that can help in that respect. And uh, you know, in my personal case, it, it was just a matter of having somebody identify what the issue was, and it, it turned it around. New kid, and so it's it's fabulous. I love the work you do. And welcome. So glad you're here. Excellent. So I would entertain a motion to affirm. So I'd like to make a motion to affirm the town manager's appointment of Andrea Conboy as the children's librarian. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, hearing any, do I hear any more conversation? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Looks like it carries. Welcome aboard. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next up, Mike Connolly for Town Treasurer Collector. Mr. Kamala. Yes. Um, does he already work for us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he already works for the town. And also, uh, I think with, uh, with mixed feelings, uh, I have to point out that uh, his appointment is only until the end of July this year. Uh, Mike has advised us that uh, he will be retiring end of July. However, that discussion is for a later date. What's up, Maureen? You're going to quit? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've informed uh, the, the town that I'm, I'm going to submit my retirement. I'll work till the end of July. That's the plan. I'm actually going in for a full knee replacement on July 30th. And then uh, both knees need to be done. So I'm at a point now where I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that. And uh, I've, got, I've got a good, good amount of time in municipal government. And as you know, I'm retired from the military. Yep. So... So I've got plans to, uh, I've, I'm looking at some other uh, career options. So I've decided for now, because I'm going to have to be recovering from the knee surgery, this is the time to uh, submit my retirement papers. Okay. We can make sure it stays a desk job. You know, <laughs> you know, get you. And, I'll, and I'll be here for, uh, like I said, till, till the end of July. That's the plan. To, oh, okay. Yeah. It's been so, over three years. I came here in May of 2016, and I appreciate Mr. Camello uh, appointing me since I had been on active duty for almost 14 years with the Air National Guard, and, and uh, I stayed in the Treasurer Collectors Association, so uh, it was an opportunity to come back into my career field after being out of it and add more years to my career, and, and it was a very good uh, learning experience over these past three, and a, three plus years, and uh, you know, I did, I did more on the borrowing end of, of things than I had done in my previous municipalities. So uh, that was a great, great experience for me. And I appreciate the time here. And I appreciate Ms. Ms. Mr. Camello picking me and bringing me on board and spending these last three plus years here with the town. Good. Well, it's been very rewarding. <clears throat> so Mr. Camello, what do we need? We need a motion? Please. Okay. I will entertain a motion. So I'll make a, I'd like to make a motion to affirm the town manager's appointment of Michael Conley as treasurer collector until July 19th. In fact, it's, 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 it's going to be the end of July. July 19th. the end of July of what, 2020? Yeah. Did you say? I'm sorry. 19th. <laughs> yeah, 2020. <laughs> 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 yeah. of, of 2019. Okay. I second with reluctance. Thank okay. you. Any, I'll be back. Any discussion? No, hearing none. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I'd like to say no, but I will say yes. <laughs> uh, so it carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. You have to come to our November 11th meeting, though, so I can wish you happy birthday again. Okay. All right. Next up is the South Asian Circle of Hopkinton Community Based Engineering Program. Hello. I'd like to welcome the South Asian Circle of Hopkinton, which will introduce a new community-based engineering program this summer for elementary school, elementary school aged children. Suffice to say that we're excited to see you tonight and note with pleasure that your organization is quickly vaulting into a significant contributor at our meetings and to Community Hopkinton. Thank you. Well, welcome. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so we are back this yep. year again. Um, yeah, so we, we are introducing this new uh, program for kids of uh, elementary school uh, age group. 
uh, it's called Community Based Engineering Design Program. And uh, I have Tej Dalvi, who uh, is also a such board member. And uh, she's the one who actually, she, she is a professor from UMass Boston, and she's the one, she's one of the people who actually uh, developed this framework. Um, and uh, I think over the last uh, couple of years, she'll talk more about this. Uh, but um, initially, as part of such, such mission, as you can see, like well, community out outreach was one of our mission. Uh, like you know, one one of the ways we wanted to accomplish our mission, like which is uh, finding avenues for uh, uh, folks in the South Asian community to to uh, volunteer their efforts in different areas, like you know, research, technology, art, uh, and we wanted to channel them into programs uh, that would benefit uh, the Hopkinton residents. So as we were thinking about it, uh, you know, and looking for opportunities, we met Tage. Uh, and we thought this would be a great way for us to bring a program into and introduce it to Hopkinton schools uh, or the children uh, of Hopkinton in that age group. Uh, so community-based engineering is, is a framework that uh, she, uh, her, her, she and her team have developed. She'll uh, talk more about it uh, and, and what we plan to do with it. Thanks, Smita. Thank you, everybody. So I'm Tej Dalvi, and I'm a professor of science and science education at physics at UMass Boston. So a couple of years back, we got some funds from National Science Foundation, NSF, in order to look for ways to bring in engineering into elementary classrooms. Now, this was more in the respect of formal education, education scenario, and that is how CBE, or community-based engineering, as we've been calling, was born. Now, this basically includes uh, young students like prime elementary uh, school levels in a identifying problems and then solving engineering problems in their own community. We've been working with this and it's a collaboration between UMass Boston, National Science Foundation and Tufts and I'm just one of the team members. Uh, and we developed this and implemented uh, the entire framework and we're working extensively with Boston Public Schools and Marlboro Public Schools. We will shortly uh, share some handouts uh, with you. Maybe they can take a look yeah, at the I handouts can. at this point. Uh, that talks in details about uh, what this program is and some success of this program. And we've got good coverage by NSF uh, and certain um, newspapers also that talks about the success of the, uh, this particular framework and this program in schooling systems. What really stood out to us was the community connection or the civic engagement part. When students were sort of uh, connecting with the community, trying to look for problems, it was amazing. They connected with their community. They really became aware. And then when they were trying to solve the problems, they sort of took agency of the problems. And it was like a give back also to the community. And and it was a wonderful combination of students working with the community and at the very same time uh, trying to be creative problem solvers. So it was a platform for them to develop these 21st century skills. And that really stood out to us. So that sort of led into our next mission of why not even try to bring this into informal education systems. And while trying to bring into informal education system, we wanted to do some pilot. And uh, I think at that point I thought, of the town that I reside in and like why not Hopkinton because we were sort of thinking about formalizing these informal workshops. Uh, we have a lot of expertise at UMass Boston and COSMIC, that Center for Science and Math and Excellence. We run a lot of uh, after school programs, extended school programs and PDs and I do want to add that we also have a very successful high school internship where I every year have interns from high school, from Hopkinton High School, uh, spend a week in uh, UMass Boston. So we sort of tried to combine all these programs together where we would work with elementary grade kids, have the Hopkinton High Schools as uh, members or students as their mentors or frontline educators and have an overall board of advisors and mentorship of the UMass Boston research team and professors. So this is the program that we are trying to bring in here. Uh, it was simply overwhelming to see all the kind of response and uh, parks and recreation and such helped us um, formalize this entire thing. And that sort of brings me to my last point, why am I doing this spiel right in front of you? A, I definitely want you to be aware of what's happening in your own town. And again, I'm gonna be a little um, 
I have my little personal agenda for you, Mass Boston, and that is I definitely want your participation. So this is an open invitation for you, and we would love to have you on the very last day of our week-long workshop, which is the Students' Expo or the Children's Expo, where they would be. So the plan for this program is we do not have an inclusive playground in Hopkinton. So the students would be designing and developing their versions of different equipment that would be a part of the inclusive playground. Now obviously these are in, uh, elementary kids, so we do not want to be over ambitions. There wouldn't be any real prototypes, but the aim is to get them thinking about their own community, engage them in uh, design thinking, creating problem solving, and have some functional prototypes ready for a display. And it would be wonderful to have um, each one of you be a part of that expo. It would, be, it would be wonderful to provide young children with encouragement to help you see what's happening in these <coughs> kinds of programs. And of course, you know, people with uh, different expertise, different um, experiences, that would always help us make connection and better the participation. So we would love to have you on the last day, it's June 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kamala, is there anything that we need to proactively do here, or is there anything that we can do to, to kind of ease these guys along? Um, this does not require a specific vote from the board. Um, I think, though, based on the comments you heard from the chair, um, there is great appreciation, support, sure. and acknowledgement of your efforts. Thank you. Uh, and we will then find a way uh, to actualize your invitation, uh, make sure that uh, we have the, board of sele the select board members uh, participating as you have requested. Thank you. Thank you. So no, no specific, specific vote is required of the okay. board. I so from the, uh, from the board, Mary Jo, why don't you want to? No, I just I have a question. This is a, a fabulous program, and I know when uh, being a girl and having been in elementary school so long ago that if somebody said their father was an engineer or somebody was an engineer, we had no idea what they were talking, were talking about <laughs> back then. Um, and I think that this is a fabulous program idea i think it could be a great program but i do wonder it can't be inexpensive what was the funding and how are we how is the funding right done? good question thank you very much um so a it is in collaboration with umass so umass is sponsoring some part of the program it would be such handling some part of the expenses and there is a nominal fee and i'm saying nominal because these days for engineering and stem camps it is exorbitant so we do have a participatory fee of $150. So most of those, um, the fee that's collected that goes towards paying for the venue, which is uh, the middle school cafeteria for us, which is again like a nominal fee, and some basic, uh, we had to get the Cory stuff done for most of for all of our, the, the members and the mentors. Um, so they, they, these things are primarily taking care of these costs but um, the rest of the cost would be taken care of by UMass Boston Outreach uh, Wing. So is it is the student's participation fee is $150? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, such is uh, going to be retaining some of that, which will go back to the community yeah. in, in uh, other That's ways. Fine. So yeah. it's, it's partly fundraising for us. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Katina. So as an engineer myself, I think this is great, and having a daughter that's going into construction engineering. It's, awesome. uh, it's uh, also awesome. Uh, you know, th these, these are just great programs um, to, to, to expose kids to uh, uh, thinking during the summer. Yes. You know, as I do, and, and in many countries, kids go to school all year, all year long, and here, kids, sometimes kids have a... Uh, I used to go to school all year long. Good or bad? school. But you know, it's just great to have the kids uh, thinking about something that, and, and where learning is fun, where yeah. they get to, where they're not even realizing that they're learning things that they can carry right through in, into, uh, into their older grades and, and right, right through high school and into uh, uh, picking what uh, fields they might want to go into, just like my daughter you know, hanging out with me doing building sites and went and going to construction engineering. So I think it's just great. Thank you for doing this. Yeah.
Thank you. Mr. Kamala. I'm sorry, Mr. Nasrullah. I <laughs> just want to say thank you for, for everything you're doing. Um, I'm incredibly impressed with, uh, with, the, with the efforts of such in putting this together. And um, for, for the community engagement, um, helping the children identify issues and look for solutions. Um, I'm also very thankful for the mentorship program um, in that uh, I think that's also something any of the students that are participating in, it's going to be a valuable experience, not only working with children, but also applying engineering uh, to problem solving. So mm -hmm. I think this is fabulous. Thank you so much for doing it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I just have one question, and uh, I'll make it quick. So for, the, for this program, it's for elementary school aged children? Yes, yes. Okay. entering grade two to grade five. Okay, so how would, so say someone wanted to send an application to get into this program, um, how would they, does it have to be South Asian? No, no we, we actually did it through Parks, Parks and Rec. Through what? Parks and Rec. Okay, yeah. Parks and Rec. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, um, I don't know, do we? No, there's no one. Be something. Next page. There's no motion on this one. Nope, there's nothing. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. I look forward to coming to the. Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, yeah. please let, please let Mr. Kamala know. I just added it to my calendar. So. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up on the agenda is the bond anticipation note. Um, Michael Connolly is here tonight seeking the, bonds, the board's approval on a bond anticipation note in the amount of. $4,518,918 for the following projects approved at the 2018 annual town meeting. Water Main Hayden Row, Water Main Cedar Street, Water, I mean, sorry, Main Street Quarter Project, uh, Campus Master Plan, Athletic Field Lighting, School Turf Fields, and School Improvements. Mike, please explain your request and why the board should approve it. Okay, uh, this is a bond anticipation note, and I've been here in the past three times for, for a ban. And uh, what this is for is to get us through the end of the fiscal year. Some of these projects have already been completed. Uh, uh, money's been spent. And um, so, so these, these, uh, these projects now need to be funded. Some of them are still happening. Some are getting ready to start. So uh, based on my input from the different department heads that are running these different projects, these, these are the amounts that they recommended that, that, that we borrow before the end of the fiscal year so that by the end of June, uh, these accounts, and some of them are in the red right now, are in the black. Um, if, if we didn't do this, then, then, then it would have an adverse or a negative effect on free cash. So it's very important that, that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we borrow this money before the fiscal year ends. Uh, some, some, like for some of these projects, I know the school athletic uh, turf field, that, that project's been complete. Uh, some are still in the, in the process. So basically, that's why we're here. Um, and the plan would be, I would, I would assume, uh, there's another bond anticipation note that's coming due in December. So the plan at that point in time would be to, to bond both this along with the ban that's coming due in December, and then you do a bond. Uh, we, we did not have a bond this fiscal year, so, so we were able to get through the fiscal year without doing a permanent borrowing. So this is, again, a temporary borrowing to get us through the end of the fiscal year. Okay, Mr. Kamala? No questions. Nothing. All right. Board? Does the board have any questions? Mr. Herb? I'm fine, thank you. I just want to <coughs> say I actually read this <laughs> at home, and this is the best company uh, of all of them that has made a bid, and I have I looked at it, and I agree with you. This is, this is the bond we should accept or we should send out. Thank you. Just like town meeting, we discussed the um, $1,500 that comes out of the Marathon Fund Committee longer than we talk about four and a half million. <laughs> but uh, no, thank you. This, this is where we're going to, this is where we're going to miss you. You, you. you put everything in order, make everything nice and neat for us. Oh, thank you. Thanks. I don't have much to add except, I mean, thank you for <laughs> making it real simple on us. Um, it, it, it 
it seems like it's needed and um, and you put it and you've dumped it down for me so that I can I can understand <laughs> this is what we need to do thank you all right hearing no further <coughs> board discussion uh, I will entertain a motion okay this is going to be a very long motion do I have to read the entire motion mr. Kamala <laughs> I shall, if you believe it's necessary. I, I believe you should read it. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the sale of um, four million five hundred eighteen thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars uh, at two point four percent general obligation bond anticipation notes, known as from now on as the notes of the town dated June seventeen two thousand nineteen, payable December twelfth two thousand nineteen, to Piper and Jaffrey and Company at par and accrued interest. If any, plus a premium of $17,668.97. Further, vote that in connection with the marketing and sale of the notes at the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and preliminary official statement dated May 28, 2019, and a final official statement dated June 3, 2019 each, in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, be and hereby be are ratified and confirmed, approved, and adopted. Further, vote that the town treasurer and the board of selectmen be and here, hereby are authorized to execute and deliver a significant events disclosure undertaken in compliance with the SEC Rule 15C2-12 in such form as may be approved by bond, bond council to the town which undertaken shall be incorporated by reference in the notes for the benefit of the holders of the notes from time to time. Further, vote that we authorize and direct the town treasurer to establish post-issuance federal tax compliance procedures and continuing disclosure procedures in such forms as the town treasurer and bond council deem sufficient. Or, if such procedures are currently in place, to review and update said procedures in order to monitor and maintain the tax exempt status of the notes and to comply with relevant security laws. Further, vote that each member of the Board of Selectmen and the Town Clerk and the Town Treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take, a, a take any and all such actions and execute and deliver such certificates, receipts, or other documents as may be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provisions of the foregoing votes. I further certify that the votes were taken at a meeting open to the public that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice of stating the place, date, time, and agenda for the meeting, which agenda included the adoption of the above, above votes, was filed with the town clerk and a copy thereof posted in a manner conspicuously vi visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building that the office of the town clerk is located, or if ap applicable, in accordance with the alternative method, method of notice prescribed or approved by the Attorney General as set forth in 940 CMR 29.032B, at least 40 hours, at least 48 hours, not including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays, prior to the time of the meeting and remain so posted at the time of the meeting so that no deliberations or decision in connection with the sale of the notes were taken in executive session, all in accordance with GLC 30A 1825 as amended. Second. Congratulations. <laughs> it helps being a lector at the church. <laughs> all right. Any other uh, discussion? Um, I, I'm Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, can I just add, very nice job by the Treasurer putting this together, 1.6% interest rate. Sure makes us all jealous. Anybody who's out there looking for money, nice. I should know that because of the strength of the town and the work of the Treasurer, we're getting very favorable financing. Awesome. Excellent job. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Can we get, can we get you back for a diem? I think we fall and do that more. I know. <laughs> We talked about rolling a pair of motorcycles into it, but we didn't think we could get away with that. It wasn't really something. It's all because of the under eye. <laughs> Thank you again. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. So, uh, is uh, uh, Paul.
Paul Winchman here? I don't see him. Can we go move forward without Paul Winchman being here on this? I think perhaps or should we table it? To, yeah, let's move table on. it and then move on to the okay. farmer's market. Farmer's market license. Uh, Hopkins Farmer's Market, Little Beehive Farm. Uh, Laura Davis and Tony Lulek join the board at the table. Uh, to help set the context for this request, can I ask Laura to share briefly about the farmer's market, which is now part of Hopkinton's fabric in the summer. Good evening. Thanks for having us. We're just entering our seventh year on the common uh, for the farmer's market. Prior to that, we were at Weston Nurseries for nine years. Mm -hmm. We also just finished our first winter market, which Peter Mezit invited us, uh, the market, into his uh, nursery for the winter, and that was very successful. Uh, generally, we have about between 20 and 24 tenths up on the common um, for, the summer, for the summer farmer's market. Um, we have had approximately uh, 400 on a slow day, but generally five or 600 people on a given Sunday. Uh, for the market and uh, we really have had uh, you can do all your shopping grocery shopping for the week at the market you can buy fish veggies uh, meat eggs um, cheese bread, honey bread, bread, bread maple syrup um, and all of these are locally produced products um, Tony's been with the market since the beginning with a little beehive farm selling honey and he's recently uh, come upon a new product, um, making mead. So we appreciate you hearing uh, him out tonight. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, Tony, if you want to explain your request and highlight your understanding of the compliance requirements discussed with our sure. staff. Sure. Um, I've been beekeeping for 15 years. Uh, I've been doing this market for actually back at Western Nurseries, which so it's been many, many years. I've been at Natick for over 12 years, um, and I have a whole line of products, not just honey. I sell hand creams, lotions, lip balms, all sorts of products. And the mead is a new product for me. Uh, I started making it about three and a half years ago. Um, I applied for my federal license back in March of last year, got my state license, and was actually approved by the Natick town of Natick back in September to start selling there. So I started doing that. So with this coming summer market, I asked Laura if I could sell the meat and had to go through all of all of the paperwork and stuff with the Department of Agriculture, you know, agricultural event. Um, I did all of my stuff for Natick with the, um, uh, they do the, it's called tips course, where you learn how to card people and, and when yeah. to card and, you know, and, and how to serve alcohol and the, the one ounce and everything. And so yeah. Um, I've, I've done all that and done all the paperwork and, and everything, and it's been very well received at Natick, and I'm hoping the same it'll, it'll be at Hopkinton. Good. Okay. Mr. Kamala? Uh, just for the general public, what is mead? Mead is oh. honey wine. <laughs> yeah, it's honey wine. So its base is about, I make five gallon batches. It's made with 20 pounds of honey, and the rest is water, and then I make a blueberry, a cranberry, an elderberry, a lemonade, a bunch of different flavored meads. Um, and you basically start it, it takes about a year, so it has to ferment in, in carboys. And I, so in my basement I have 15 carboys all, all percolating at the same time. Uh, it's the oldest known alcohol to man, it goes back to the Vikings. Uh, and the term honeymoon actually comes from the Viking couple being given mead to drink and then they had to like stay together for 28 days which was the cycle of the moon so honey moon and mead it all ties into the Vikings so that's just a little history nice yeah so <clears throat> mr. Kamalu um, sample sizes can exceed one ounce no more than five samples to be served to an individual provided in single-use disposable cups uh, vendor provides trash receptacles uh, to accommodate the cups, vendor must ID individuals, thus the TIPS certification, yep. uh, and bottles opened and used for sampling can't be sold to the public. Yep. This if someone drank five ounces of this, it would be, they, it's a lot. It's very What's potent. the alcohol content? 20%. 20%. 20%. Yeah. 40 proof. Yep. Yeah, so I would I, never, I served like this much yeah. at the bottom of a little glass, so yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Kamala, legally we're covered if, if we... Like they don't need to go for an alcohol license or anything like that here, correct? Correct. Um, under the Mass General Laws, this is the process in place okay. for the approval of this type of a license. 
and all paperwork that they they've submitted to paperwork and town satisfied with everything is that where we're at here or tell me where we're at yes the permitting staff has reviewed the application uh, provided their comments those comments have been shared uh, with the applicant uh, and should the board be inclined to approve this license i think and i recommend that the license should uh, articulate the conditions that are included or that okay. you just went through. Okay. Yes. <coughs> All right. Uh, board members, um, let's start with Mr. Nasrullah. Um, so how, how much is, like, what is a serving of mead? Uh, it's, it's sort of like an after-dinner drink, a cordial. So, I mean, I sell it in 250 milliliter bottles. So it's not like you're going to even drink like a whole wine bottle. Um, and after after dinner drink, you can mix it with drinks, seltzer. It's got a bunch of different uses, but usually small glasses at room temperature or over ice. It's, it's sort okay. of an after dinner drink. As a, as a home brewer, I'd always been curious about making mead. Yeah, but uh, it's fun. Never never had the honey. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I, I look forward to seeing it. I think it sounds cool. Yeah, please stop by and. If I am granted, please stop by for a sample. Sure. All right, Mr. Cotino. You know, I just I just love having the farmers market all, all summer long over at the common. It's just it's great. <clears throat> My only experience with mead is uh, from the Bud Light commercials. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the autumnal mead. Uh, but uh, you know, it, I think it's just going to be a, 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 you know, an, another fun thing that we have at Hopkinton. Good. Mr. Her. I'm all set. That's great. Mary Jo? I think it's great, too. I, I love mead, uh, and I've had it a lot. I believe Irish <laughs> Miss, too, is a honey. What's a lot? Liqueur. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Are we talking a 12-step program? Or? Talking it's all it's it's talking not about that much. Is that tonight no. you're talking along? <laughs> the, only, the only thing I want to ask you about is that the, the police department requests that you have a policy in place to check the identification of everybody receiving some mead. And uh, just was wondering what you plan on looking at everybody's ID or that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think this is terrific. All right, so I'm good here. Uh, no further. Uh, one more comment. One more um, comment. I'd like to thank, is it Marie or Maria? Maria. She was phenomenal that we kind of did this not last yep. minute, but she yep. rushed it through. She she was wonderful to us and everything. So really appreciate that. Yep, she's great. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Uh, I will entertain. Hearing no more discussion, I will entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve a farmers market license for a little beehive farm to sell meat at the Hopkins Farmers Market on Sundays from June 9th, 2019, until October 13th, 2019. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? Carries. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so we are kind of on time here, the water and sewer rate discussion. Uh, you guys ready? Yes, we are. All right. Nice entrance. <laughs> nice entrance. <laughs> Still haven't gone over the fact that you cheered for Wachusett. But we're going to work on that. <laughs> All right. So we are holding a preliminary discussion of the municipal water and sewer rates. The public hearing on the same is scheduled for June 25th. So this sounds to us like this is going to be something maybe closer to 30,000 feet, more than the nitty gritty <laughs> Harris Astari arguing points from last year. So. Welcome again. Thank you. Good to be back. Mr. Westling, do you want to introduce the, what we have going on here? Or? Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, speaking of timing, the town manager is walking in right now and he will begin the discussion. Can we get those printouts again this <laughs> year that, that show the. That'll be on the 25th. <laughs> oh, okay. This is the 30,000. Okay. They should have also. John, can we kill it, Shane? Through the chair, they should have also been part of your packet. I don't know if it was. But I will scroll right over and tell you. It was. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you. Then I have to face this way. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, You're and thank you to the board. So I guess we just go. 
as we have done in past years, we scheduled this discussion as a preliminary review of the state of the water and sewer enterprise businesses. Uh, you may also recall that the board's involvement in this discussion is through your role as the water and sewer commissioners. Also, I am delighted to share with the board and the community uh, that through the generosity of the community, we have more resources dedicated to this process. Uh, members of the finance team, led by the CFO, Tim O'Leary, are now playing a more significant role in this process. Um, we also continue to rely on our consultant uh, to put together the report. Uh, as always, um, members of the DPW, led by your Director of Public Works, uh, John Westerlin, uh, and the Water and Sewer Manager, Eric Curry, are doing the heavy lifting, providing the day-to-day -day operations as well as the data uh, that <coughs> relates to the day-to-day -day operations of the enterprise. Uh, tonight's presentation will be in three parts. I'm giving the introduction. John will speak to the business, assisted by Eric. And this uh, consultant will um, enumerate or elaborate on the report that he put together for the town. And our CA4, um, supported by Dave Naltajian as well as Ben, would walk you through what these numbers mean for the community. Again, the intention today is to have a preliminary discussion. The public hearing is scheduled for June 25th. Great. We'll start off with the sewer enterprise. The current financial position of the sewer enterprise is unfavorable or the level of revenues predicted. The projected financial position that is looking into the future is marginal for the level of revenues projected pending, I want to emphasize this, pending specific corrective action by the town. The town sewer enterprise continues to be challenged by a combination of substantial debt service and a revenue loss tied to a dramatic flow reduction by our two largest consumers in the past years, namely Dell EMC and Lonza. Our financial statements showed the sewer enterprise with capital assets that cost us $46 million, now depreciated down to $28 million, with total assets of the 36 million and liabilities of 12 million, the system has a positive net worth of 24 million. But that net position involves assets and liabilities, not annual revenues and expenses. The system faces cash flow challenges in paying for operations and in paying for a substantial debt load. The town sewer system currently saves about 1,500 residential accounts, about 90 commercial accounts, and about 30 industrial accounts. With a $45 million cost, the capital investment in the sewer enterprise is about 28,000 per user. And based on the latest statewide data available, as of 2017, the sewer fees in Hopkinton were already 21% above the state average. As we all know, the sewer enterprise has been balancing its annual operations by drawing down retained earnings. I think this is an issue that we've been looking into 
for some time now. And we have reached the conclusion that whilst we may all like using the phrase retained earnings, and I think some, 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 um, some time, I think in fact last year, there was reference to a windfall uh, when we were talking about both water and sewer. Uh, we need to be, and I think you are going to hear this from our finance team, we need to be crystal clear on what the retained earnings constitute, what they are, how they will end, and whether it is advisable to continue to look at them as retained earnings that we can use to balance the budget. In FY20, the enterprise faces shortfalls of approximately 550,000 after the application of 230,000 in retained earnings at the recent town meeting. The shortfall peaks at just over 200,000 in FY20, over 900,000 in FY21 and drops to 670,000 in FY22 as some debt is paid off. And thus, we have a structural deficit. At this point, with your permission, I'll let John speak to what are the services provided through this department? What are the levels of service that we provide as a government entity? And most importantly, what do the customers think about your service? Mr. Kamala, can I just jump in for one second? Um, <clears throat> I know that you said our two largest um, clients was um, uh, EMC, Dell EMC, and um, Lonza. Lonza, correct. So I know that we lost Lonza, but didn't we just pick up Lycan? Yeah, we picked up Lycan. We were so excited when they came before the town. However, I think we were all in this room uh, when they told us that they would be using perhaps one-sixth okay. of the okay. water yep, uh, sure. compared to Lonza. Okay. Excuse me, to the chair, but hasn't Lonza been gone like five years now? Oh, correct. All right. Mr. Westerling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and through the chair, good evening. The sewer division is managed by Eric Carty, transports and treats nearly 130 million gallons of wastewater per year from approximately 1,650 customers. But what's beyond the drain? The operation and maintenance of the sewer system is handled by two full-time sewer technicians who are responsible for managing eight sewer pumping stations and more than 40 miles of sewer pipe. Wastewater can flow to Westboro, Fruit Street, or Milford for treatment. And last year we pumped over 110 million gallons of wastewater to Westboro and over 18 million gallons to Fruit Street. We were able to manage our wastewater flows last year we didn't send any wastewater to Milford, and that was in an effort to keep our treatment cost as low as possible because Milford treatment costs eight, excuse me, seven times higher than our other options. We do our best to prevent extraneous flows from entering the sewer system to keep our treatment costs related only to wastewater flows. And last year we completed an II, or inflow and infiltration study, of our entire pipe network, and we created a plan to remove any II and that plan was approved by the Department of Environmental Protection. The next steps in that plan are to identify those pipe segments that have the potential for the largest amount of II and take the necessary steps to remove that II from the system. The current capital plan for the sewer division focuses primarily on maintaining our vehicle fleet over the next few years. But this year's town meeting appropriated funds to update the 15-year-old comprehensive wastewater management plan. And that effort will reevaluate areas of need for sewer, and that plan will likely generate a capital plan for the town to consider if it wishes to extend sewer service in the future. Customer service is a top priority for the DPW and the sewer division, and the sewer division ranked above the national benchmark for citizen satisfaction in the town's last survey. In addition, since that time, we've instituted an iWork software program and that manages requests for service and ensures that we respond to all requests in a timely manner. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the Select Board, this is Matt Abrahams, happy to be back with you again this year. Matt Abrahams from the Abrahams Group. I am here to present the results of the water and sewer rate study that we have done for the town of Hopkinton and to present the challenges that both the water and sewer enterprise funds are facing at this time. We are focused on sewer at this moment. We will speak about water momentarily. So as we've done in the past for the town, our analysis started out as a five-year look into the future for what projected revenues and expenditures look like for both water and sewer. But through heavy collaboration with town staff, and during that collaboration, we had some great discussion about the matter. We've extended that out to a look that's beyond five years. We looked at 10 years and then eventually even to a, a look larger than 10 years, way into the future. Also, through collaboration, we decided that we were going to take a, a heavy look at how <clears throat> revenues tied to operations of both water and sewer compared to expenditures tied to operations and how revenues tied to capital compared to expenditures tied to capital and what those numbers look like as well. Next slide, please. So we have a slide for you with some of the important data points. Let me get in there. Hit that right there. Right there. Now you get hit with the moss. You get hit with the moss. So we have a slide for you to talk about some important data points related to sewer. As Mr. Wesseling already mentioned, there is a capital plan on the sewer side. It is, it is uh, designed to replace some vehicles in the near future, but it does include the comprehensive wastewater management plan that was voted at the most recent town meeting. And in the analysis, we have projected debt related to that. And also, as Mr. Wesseling has said, uh, that may lead to an additional, additional capital improvements or recommended investments down the road. For debt, this was already mentioned a little bit by Mr. Kamalo, debt is 47% of the budget in FY20. The amount is $1.3 million in FY20 and in FY21 as well. And it decreases a little bit when debt comes off the books in FY22, goes down to about $980,000 about the same amount in FY23, and then down to about 910,000 in FY24. And we, wanna, we want to make sure that we are focused a little bit on the 1.3 million and how that relates to the year after that. There's about a $300,000 drop there. And also, just so members of the board are aware, the debt number for FY19 was $1.7 million, a number that is higher than the FY20 number. Betterment receipts are still incoming for the, for the phases, some of the phases for the sewer development, but it does not cover all debt that is currently on the books. There's about a, a greater than $600,000 shortfall in both FY20 and 21, and that goes down to about $400,000 in FY22 and beyond. Betterments that were paid in advance flowed to retain earnings. They were not set aside to pay off the debt related to the phases. So therefore, they were available to be used for balancing the budget, as has already been discussed. On the flow side, we took a look at the industrial accounts, of which there are about 30 in the town, and took a look at their flow for the last several years. And we looked back to 2013, compared it to 2018. All industrial flow is down 68% during that time frame. Again, focusing on those largest users that were already mentioned, that drop is 84% just for those, those, uh, those users. <coughs> and this has, a, a, as you would suspect, a large financial impact. And if we took a look at just what that impact might mean in FY19, and the number was around $500,000. Townwide, we took a look at all flow townwide, and all flow is down in the past year. So this is comparing the current fiscal year, FY19 to FY18, 10% in just one year. Comparing 18 to 17, the number is 6%. And this, this would have an impact, it has had an impact on user charges revenue being brought in to the sewer fund. Th that has been down each of the last two years as well. The number was about $1.5 million in FY17, decreased to about $1.35 million in FY18, and we're projecting a little bit less than $1.3 million in FY19, and that is with rate increases the last two years. So user charges revenue is decreasing despite rate increases the last few years. The next section compare, 
that shows the comparison I mentioned a few minutes ago about how we are comparing operating revenues to operating expenditures. And we saw that revenues on the operating side do not cover operating expenditures in FY20 and beyond. Currently, we're looking at about $150,000 shortfall in FY20. Therefore, a rate, rate action is recommended in order to ensure that operating revenues cover operating expenses. And we believe we're looking at a large rate increase tied to that in FY20. On the capital side, same comparison. We saw that capital revenues do not cover capital expenditures. And we are seeing a shortfall of about $400,000 in FY20 and one that expands beyond that to about $670,000 in FY21. So again, because of that, we are looking at a rate, a large rate change in each of the next two years to try and close that shortfall. Retained earnings on the sewer side is near depletion. Currently, available retained earnings is less than $100,000. And because that number is so low, it can no longer be, retained earnings can no longer be used, relied upon to help balance the sewer budget. And reserves, we continue to recommend reserves for both the water and sewer fund. On the operating side, we're, we're recommending a $300,000 reserve, which would be about 16% of the operating expenses. And on the sewer side, about $300,000 to replace a large asset in case of emergency. So now I'm going to hand it over to our CFO here. OK. Thank you. And, and as Tim is setting up, I really encourage you to uh, use your iPads. I believe um, he will be speaking to uh, a document that you can view um, uh, on your iPads as he's speaking. So I have a document up on my screen, and it's not showing up on the big screen yet. Ben, what's the trick here? We need the children's librarian. We need the children's librarian. OK, great. So, and I think he had it set to the best size. So this is a busy chart, and... Uh, Hopefully everybody has HD. Yeah, HD, that's right. So uh, I, I can kind of go through this chart, I think, because it's busy. The thing we're trying to capture on there is that line on the bottom that shows retained earnings over the long run. And I'm sorry about the resolution, but we really wanted the balance giving you a multi-year view and, uh, and getting everything on the page. So you can see at that retained earnings chart down there where I just clicked on the box, that's zero. And, and the trajectory with no rate increase shows us moving down into the negative $12 million range. So that's just the baseline of where we are. I'd like to talk to you about the setup of this sheet. Let me try to get that off of there. The setup of the sheet, um, it shows a 15-year horizon based on the existing debt tail off. That's why we selected that time frame, because to look at what we find is that things like betterments are erratic in their revenue. Debt is erratic as it drops off. You'd like to think all the revenues and expenses would be matched together and would rise and fall together, but they don't. And when they don't, it creates bulges like the bulge we have in FY20 and 21, uh, where there are substantial shortfalls that even out just a couple years later as some debt goes away and the betterment stay steady there for a short, a short while. Uh, I want to call your attention to the top section there that I'm kind of highlighting. And that's a summary of the uh, operating revenue and expenses. And that projects out for many years. And as Matt said, this is all based on the data that Abrams had developed and has been developing for years. Uh, we're talking about $150,000 deficit in 20, rising to 187 in 21, 226,000 in 22, and that's all because these expenses for uh, operating the facilities, paying the treatment operations, the indirects that are charged <coughs> for the town, and the salaries go up by a couple of percent a year. So that compound, the compound effect shows that line growing with no rate increases. Uh, to eight hundred thousand dollars, you know, in twenty thirty four of a shortfall, but right now the immediate issue is that we're one hundred fifty thousand dollars short for twenty twenty. 
Then if you go down to the second section, the capital section, it looks at betterment as revenue and uh, the expenses for debt. And something I have to point out here, the $230,000 that was voted at town meeting uh, is already in there as a revenue source. Uh, the next thing down here for structure before I go through a couple numbers in more detail is the net results. So, so uh, the net results line shows here how the annual results are and you can see as it goes to the right that the results get worse and worse without rate adjustment. And then the retained earning balance, which is a requirement of our state regulator to maintain a positive retained earning balance so the enterprise is viable, is that we should have a positive retained earning balance as a minimum. Uh, and the town manager has spoken about the desire to have some level of reserves as well. And you can see we start out with a negative retained earnings in 2020 of 420000 and it gets much, much worse if no action is taken over time. Uh, I just wanted to make the point about the uneven revenue sources like betterments and the uneven expenses like debt which tails off in lumpy chunks and that those timing mismatches create bulges mm -hmm. and ideally we would like to deal with those bulges through steady rate policies instead of driving like we're behind a car on the freeway and we're reacting to the brake lights in front of us and while the car's going we go 90 miles an hour behind them and when the car breaks we come to a complete stop without looking two or three cars ahead so really our goal is to try to start looking two or three cars ahead here uh, i'm going to go back up here to row 14 the net revenue uh, and of course as both matt and i have just previously said operating revenue is not generating enough money to cover operating costs let alone to throw off some needed contribution to debt service that shortfall grows without a rate increase as expenses rise. So our first problem is that user revenue is not covering operating expenses. The next big point goes down to row 19, uh, which is this betterment revenue. You can see that our better, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll explain to you that as I highlight across here, our betterment revenue drops off here over time as people satisfy their obligation to us and it drops off more rapidly than the debt that it was associated with. So I've highlighted these two lines in a kind of a tan color, and you can see there's a gap every year between the, what the betterments will pay for and what the, what the debt associated with the betterments is. Uh, so the betterment is insufficient to support that debt stream, and then we have other debt. Uh, moving down to row 22. Okay, you can see we're already using $230,000 to balance uh, the, to try to balance the 2020 budget and yet more is needed. <laughs> Row 28 shows the shortfall between the betterment and connection, betterment revenue and connection revenue, which is substantial for us, and the debt service we have on the books. So that's basically, we have a line above that talks about how the operation's doing, 150 short on operations in 2020, and about $400,000 short in the capital part for that sum that Matt mentioned of $550,000 short. That's going to require immediate attention. Um, and then down at row 30 shows the retained earnings, again in tan. And this deficit this year will push our retains earnings negative, which of course the state regulator will not allow us to do. And then if we were to continue somehow, it would go negative and negative and negative and be a spiraling problem. Unfortunately, we're not in a position here where we can address this through a series of steady rate increases and remain compliant with DOR. Uh, immediate substantial action is required. So the, the Nice thing about this tool, and we hadn't, we, this was for our internal discussion, but uh, Norman decided he should bring it out and show it to you all so you can use it and play with it. So I'm going to put in some perspective rate increases here, and as I do, you'll see that blue line for retained earnings start to normalize a little. So the first uh, 
The first rate increase is a very large 35% increase in the first year. And you can see with a 35% increase in 2020, if you go down to the bottom of that column, it, it barely makes us stable in that year with a $29,000 surplus. And again, that's after already putting 230,000 retained earnings in there. So it's not a great situation. Uh, worse yet, 2021 is the big bulge year for debt when uh, we have our largest gap in debt payment. So I'm gonna plug in, just to begin the discussion, an additional 25% increase there. Now you can see what happened to that blue line. We went from going into negative country to where that line would go up and hit around $750,000 and then begin to come down again uh, years out, 10 years out, 12 years out. So that is a path that would create some stability for us. And I, I left one number in there. I got to make a little adjustment here. Yeah, so a line that's good but not as good. So that gets us up to about $500,000 and creates stability. So that gives you a sense of what it takes to get stability in this very unfortunate situation. Uh, we could try to go with a lower increase in the first year and spread them out more. The problem is it gives us a negative retained earning balance, which our regulator is loath to accept from us. Uh, so really, really long term, if we did 20, 35 in year one, 25 in year two, we had no raises for a few years, and then we had a few years of 2% raises. You know, you could see that we have a very healthy enterprise with that kind of increased revenue. Uh, I'm gonna throw out another scenario, and there are thousands, you know, there's infinite number of scenarios here. Again, to keep compliant with DOR, leaving that whopping 35% increase in year one, if we reduced the second year down to a series of 6% increases, and I'm gonna put four of them in a row. And then we have a couple of years of 2% increases. That's a better glide path, but you see that the retained earning line dips down. So to make a more uh, softer strategy like that work, would work, what we would have to do is do what was done here in 2004 and authorize a loan from the general fund to the retain to the enterprise. And so I just plugged in a $350,000 loan there in 2021 from the general stabilization fund to the sewer fund. And you can see that flat lines our retained earnings, keeps us compliant, and then we begin to grow again, and then we have to pay off the loan. You see $350,000 in payback there for that loan. So, um, you know, driving, behind the car in traffic, what this says is 35% in year one to stay compliant uh, because we don't really have the opportunity to make a loan this year mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, and we could follow up with another substantial loan and stabilize the enterprise in one shot, or we could do a series of actions that keep us compliant and stabilize it over a longer run. So this is really a policy decision and we created this tool so that you could work with it in the intervening couple weeks and I'd be happy to meet with you. Uh, we'd be happy to meet with any members of the board to talk about this uh, and, and how to use it and how to interpret it. There are several paths to stability. Uh, none of them are particularly pleasant because of where we are today, but there are several effective paths. I added one little feature to this because we're always concern about the impact on the rate holders, especially those who are the most uh, at risk and vulnerable rate holders. So I put three numbers there in the chart. I put a middle user, which is somebody who uses about 6,300 6, cubic feet of water a year and showed, for example, the impact of the 35% rate would be interpolated on that chart as $210 a year. I also put, I, I did a standard deviation of the whole data set, and I wanted to look at where's the bulk of the users. So 68% of our users use between 
3,300 cubic feet and 9,200 cubic feet. And so I wanted to look at the impact, for example, of a 35% rise on those people. So for the low user, maybe a single person living in a house who's been there for a long time, doesn't, doesn't use a lot of water, the impact of this first year would be about $110 for the average middle user, a family using 6,300 cubic feet, would be about $210. And for the high user, the irrigator, the, uh, the people who wash clothes the way we do at my house, every time somebody looks at them, that would be about $300 a year impact. And uh, so I had hoped to be here presenting excellent news the first time I had to present something like this. but. Uh, I think uh, it's news, and it's it's we have the details, and we understand the situation. Yeah. Um, oh. Through the chair, um, again, much thanks to John and Eric and your teams, um, Matt Abraham's team, Dave and Benny, uh, for for doing this work. What does this mean for the board? Number one. We have a structural deficit. We've been talking about this issue for a while. Now is the time to address it. Number two, we believe in, in, in our fingertips now are the details that identify the sources and the uses. Number three, we have to dispel this myth about the retained earnings. Similar with water, we have to be clear as to what component or what percentage of the retained earnings pertains to the operating budget and what percentage of the retained earnings is tied to future debt service. Use those numbers as the guidelines as to do we use retained earnings to support the budget or we don't. We also have to go forward, going forward, we have to be clear in terms of our fees are coming in, they are paying for operating Cost. Is there sufficient money left above that responsibility to pay for debt service? We can't do that as far as this enterprise is concerned at this moment. That's why it is important that going forward we now create the reserves. Without those reserves, I don't believe we'll be able to address the structural deficit. And most spectacularly, the board has been asking for a dynamic model to review this issue. We have that now. And finally, tied to that, again, this is a big policy question. You can see where this is going, where a decision has to be made whether we address this issue by putting the responsibility on the ratepayers, or we step back as a community and say, we own this issue as we've done in past years, is this the moment perhaps to think about a loan to the enterprise, which is then paid back? And I think the numbers show that this is possible. Um, that's the signal that I should stop at this point. <laughs> well timed, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Katina. Are you done, Mr. Kamala? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a question. It, what, what confuses me is that three years ago and even two years ago, we were, we were sitting here talking about the, that the fund was okay and we were talking about no rate increase or uh, even on the water a rate, rate decrease. And what's confusing to me is that just two years later, or well, 30 months later, we're now talking about a 30% rate increase to stay stable. Who dropped the ball? Or why, were we why do we get confusing information so that we thought that we were going to be able to do a rate decrease and now we have to do a, rate, a massive rate increase? If I may, and I'll say this respectfully, I really encourage the board to go back to the previous reports. The discussions and the data identified the challenges. There were discussions and deliberations by the board as to how to move forward. Decisions which I respect and I support at this point were made. Those decisions were made with the understanding that there were issues regarding the sewer enterprise. I, I just want to make that clear. 
and I say this respectfully. Yeah, because you know, through the chair again, sorry. You know, it, it, it's kind of a revolting development. You know, here we tell, we tell people to conserve water, conserve water, and now we're down 10% in the usage of our sewer system. You know, and the, and the uh, industrial users, what we're talking about, um, they're down, uh, what, 68%, and, you know, and then, it, it, it's, uh, and then in just one year, uh, what, 19% of the six largest users? in just one year you know and this is the, you know this is the stuff that we, we come up in, in, in the zoning advisory committee is constantly talking about uh, for the tightening bylaws to and to restrict certain companies from coming into town and businesses from coming into town not realizing that empty buildings means that there's no water and sewer use right. and that's and there's no personal property taxes and and that if we're going to try and cherry pick who we want to come into you know into our town that that, that it's got uh, reverberating effects. I can throw the chair, that's a, that's a great point. It's a challenge that we all grapple with. Um, it's a situation where we as a community, and also through the state regulations, would like to support water conservation. At the same time, that's our main source of revenue for this enterprise. Yeah, and to the chair. So it's it's a tough one to you know to tell people you you're doing a good job. Now I'm going to charge you more. Yes, sir. That's it's yeah. it's also challenging. People who are on water and sewer have average lower use than people who are on just water. So it shows that people are sensitive to the rates. People are rate sensitive. There's elasticity of demand in this. And the problem is, if you raise rates, you could lose yet more use, have more people conserve, and then the pie, as with the tax, property tax pie, still has to be paid for, and so you have to raise rates again. So the challenge is if you raise rates so much that you drop consumption, you have to then raise rates again because the flow is down and the revenue is down. To the chairs, is there something else? Is, are there other things if this was a private business? People would be looking into other ways to manage costs. Are there any other ways of managing costs in this, or is it strictly flow? So the debt is the is the big the, uh, the big dog in the room here, the, the existing the debt. debt. And so I spoke to the and others about the possibility of restructuring the debt, but. Under municipal finance law, a bit, I mean, a business would do that. If you had a viable business with, you know, $35 million in assets and $12 million in liabilities and a steady customer base, you would refinance your debt, stretch it out, and you would get yourself into a sustainable situation. Uh, we don't have that luxury because it's a one-time bite at the apple for the tax advantage debt. So apparently if we refinance the debt, we lose that we lose more than we would gain by trying to stretch out our debt. So we've looked at that. We've looked at, the, you know, the other big cost is the treatment cost. And that is substantially uh, unfixed. And then we, we really have a very tiny staff managing this $45 million uh, infrastructure. So we have had those discussions and hit through all these bases. And... Uh, you know, I, th I think the bigger issue is we have a $45 million sewer system serving 1,700 customers, and that's a that's a challenge. That that's a challenge. Maybe just one more, and I'll stop. Sum it up. You know, it's so so. But you know, one of the things is that you know, we were talking about having the town pick up, but we have what do we have about 4,500 homes uh, 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 in town and 1,700 users. So we have to also be careful that there is a small user group and then to have everybody else pick up for the for just the 1,700 users is, is also a question we have to be sensitive to also. Mm -hmm. If I may on that point, again, this is a policy decision. The bulk of the 1,700 users did pay their share. Some of them paid their payments upfront in full. And so out of fairness, the town has to grapple with, do we go back to the people who already paid for the system and ask them to pay more? It's a tough one. Mr. Hur? Uh, I'll answer that one in a second. Yeah. Um, so a couple of thoughts. Uh, I'm not surprised 
we're here tonight having this conversation. Uh, I think this has been building over a number of years, certainly the 10 or 11 years I've sat here. Um, we have been a pain in the backside in the past about increases. In fact, I think one year we had a decrease in the sewer enterprise fund. Uh, I think it was a two or three percent decrease. So we have been uh, very stingy for lots of different reasons. Some of, the, some of it, I think, was confusion on our part. Uh, I won't speak for my colleagues, but me in the past, about the retained earnings and what that means and how we could use that, right? Uh, and so I think a lot of things are kind of coming together. Uh, but I think in general, because we were very reluctant in the past to do some rate increases that we probably should have done for other reasons, because of the recession and everything else, um, we are where we are. So I'm not surprised we're here. I think the presentation was excellent and it was very easy to understand and I appreciate having a live spreadsheet there popping in numbers because that's wholly different than what we've seen in the past, right? So that was really cool and I think that was very um, telling. I'm totally opposed to a general fund loan. Having lived through a general fund loan years ago that we then had to pay back, it was very difficult to get to pay it back because when we have our budget discussions on everything else and then we go, oh yeah, we gotta throw 200 grand over here for some loan we took out six years ago, that doesn't go over very well. So I wouldn't wanna sort of handicap a future board with that challenge because it's a difficult challenge to overcome during your normal budget cycle to do a general fund loan. So I'd be opposed to that. Um, and I know we're not really in the public hearing thing tonight, but I just want to throw it out there. And you covered the 35% and what that dollar amount means. So 35% is a huge percentage. We've always talked about two, three, six, and if we had eight or nine, we were having a hissy fit up here. But 35% is a huge number. It's $200. Now $200 to some residents, whatever, it's 200 bucks, let's go. $200 to other residents is a big issue and we have to be sensitive to that issue as well. So um, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not surprised we're here. I do think we can solve it, but I also think that it's time that we kind of get into this as a board and make some tougher decisions that in the past, we, at least I, have admittedly sort of put off into the future. So here we are, we gotta pay the piper a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for those, you know, if, let's say we do go to a hundred and, 50 or 60 or $200 increase uh, on that average residence for this coming year. Well, we could have done 50 bucks a year over the last six years and would have been about the same, but we chose not to. So we didn't take it then, we may have to take it now. It's kind of like, it's the same thing in many ways as the excess levy except in reverse, right? So that's kind of how I look at it is, we left it in their pockets, now it's time, we're gonna have to take it on this one. We left the excess levy in people's pockets. We passed the underride. We're never going to take that. But it's the same kind of concept, you know? So the time has sort of run out. And I, for one, am willing to look at some crazy percentages to make us right for the future. Is that? Mr. Masrula. <clears throat> it is some very difficult decisions. Um, one thing that comes to mind is the II study, Mr. Wesselini, you mentioned. Um, had we identified how much flow is going to be, is, is right now an infiltration and uh, inflow? Do we know? Through the chair, I don't have that number tonight, but I will say that our system is fairly sound and fairly tight because it's not that old. Right. And Eric and the team, they do a great job of managing the system, make sure that there's no manhole covers that are loose or, or other ways to get the inflow and infiltration in. But the plan as approved, by, as approved by DEP will allow us to go in, we'll look at segments that show the potential for the greatest amount of inflow and infiltration, and we'll set up a plan to remove that. And we have money in our operating budget this year and next to take those first two steps. Now, as we go through this process in essentially removing water, uh, this lowers our treatment costs, correct? So that is one of the cost-saving measures that we're talking about. Okay, um, and that's that's just a cost that we can lower. Am I correct in that, assuming that? That's correct. And have we taken that into account in in our projections in what we were just looking at? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no, we have not taken that into account. Our projections are based on the current situation. 
So I guess I guess my thought is um, I agree with what Mr. Hur is saying that there's you know we've kind of kicked the can down the down the street for a while, but another thing that just kind of occurs to me is that these numbers are all based on projections and assumptions. We don't really know what's coming in the future. So for us to sit here and say, oh, we need a 35% increase year after year after year, um, I think we can look at this year and try to level things off. But um, you know, what's gonna happen in the future? I think we don't know what those, we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know how much uh, cost reduction we're gonna have, and we also don't know how much, uh, if we get more, more users, more industrial users, so. Just thinking out loud. If, if I may. Yes, Mr. If, if through the chain. Um, I, I mean, just to be clear, the, the, the 35% is in reference to FY19. Right. Those numbers are actual, they're based on the budget. Yes, for the remaining months, we're projecting. The next year, yes, we are suggesting also a higher percentage increase. However, after the first two years, with this part that we want to deal with, after the first two years, we believe if the plan moves forward as discussed, we will normalize and go down to 2.5%. 2.5. Yes, I thought, I thought it said four. No, it's a two well, there's different, there's different scenarios. I, have, you, different, I, thought, yeah, I, I have different scenarios. I thought it was at 35, 25, four, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But whatever. So the real problem is in the next two years, getting the, mm -hmm. rid of the debt. Mm -hmm. Some, somewhere we're going to have to bite the bullet to get rid of the debt. Either, either yep. take the 500 or the 660, whatever it is, from the stabilization fund, which you don't want to do. <laughs> you understand that. Uh, and see what happens then with the figures and helps out as a, as a loan. But uh, otherwise, I mean, we have to pay off that debt yep. to get to, and for two years, it's going to be a two-year problem. So for me, I always think about the seniors uh, whenever we start talking about uh, increases in anything. Um, and I, I tend to think that a lot of the seniors, you know, if, if we go up 35%, um, you know, it's 200 bucks. And that might be 200 bucks that the seniors don't have. And then as I look at it a little bit close, more close, Lee, um, the seniors probably aren't middle use. You know, they're probably, they probably use a little bit less. So it, it's not going to be the $200. I'm always very, very hesitant to put my seal of approval on an increase that is going to adversely affect um, the seniors because I know a lot of them and I know a lot of them are, are not, uh, not swimming in it. So they are okay, swimming in it. Nice. Um, so I'm always concerned about the increases. I don't think that the, you know, this 35% increase, that number is a, a very scary number. Uh, and then when you take the 35% and then add in another 25% on top of that next year, so exponentially it kind of moves along and, and that 200 turns into 350 and blah, blah, blah. And then you carry that for, you know, for the rest of your life. Um, but, you know, in, in thinking of the seniors, I think that, you know, it, it's not going to affect them quite as much because I don't, for, foresee you know a senior with either one or two people in their house using as much water as Brian and his 50 kids or uh, whomever so uh, I don't think it's going to be as much of an impact on them so I don't have I'm not as hesitant and I do remember us arguing about uh, the last few years about you know keeping the rates low and dealing with the increase when it comes up and uh, unfortunately I think that's where we're at right yeah. now so one more through the chair, if I may. One more. Um, so, what, 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 you know, Mr. Hur was just talking about, you know, he believed that we were trying to keep the money in the people's pockets. But the numbers didn't, even just last year, the numbers didn't seem this grave. Was it, you know, was it the 10% the, the drop this year? Was it the, was a larger drop than we, we anticipated? In, in the in the flow, because I, I don't think we would have missed it by by thirty percent. If you if, if we were told last year, um, next year is going to be a thirty percent uh, uh, rate rate increase or thirty five percent rate increase if we don't go up five percent or ten percent, whatever it was, because I I don't think that 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 this board or any board would have missed it by by that much. You know, so I'm wondering where the um, where the, the, the that 
huge uh, drop came from or the, uh, the change? I can't came. speak with certainty, but I can take a stab at it because I wasn't here. There was a pool of retained earnings, and if there had been a 20% increase last year, we might have more retained earnings left to get us through the bubble. So sometimes the timing is that if you do a couple of smaller increases earlier, they can get you through this tough bubble. But we spent $900,000 in retained earnings in 19 to keep the system afloat. And now we face the bulge in 20 and 21, and we don't have the money to, to do that. And if DOR allowed us to go into deficit for a couple of years, we could do that and climb out with steadier rate increase. But we're cash poor, and we have two mortgage payments coming due. Okay, I am done. Mr. Kamala, what do we need to do? Nothing? Tell them thank you and see you on the 25th? Yes, and I think what we have paused before the board uh, is an opportunity for us to continue this conversation. I actually was uh, suggesting to staff that, uh, or remarking to staff this afternoon that I actually saw tonight's discussion as a work session okay. where we're hearing ideas. I think what I've heard from the board is we are faced uh, with the situation that we have to deal with. Uh, number two, that we stay true to our principles, uh, make sure that whatever proposal we put forth uh, takes into consideration the impact on the different uh, groupings in, in the community. Uh, and then number three, that I think we continue taking a long-term view on the health of, of this fund. Okay, any other questions from uh, the board? I just wanted a reminder, too, that we're, we're talking sewer issues right now. Yep. We're also we're still, looking we're at water. a 5% water increase, so. Yep. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. If you could, please. Mr. Cardi has been uh, managing this business for us for many, many years, and I'm just interested in his take on sort of where we are uh, with the assets, the need for the assets as the flow is coming down. So can we back off some asset expense somewhere? Is that a possibility? I don't know. Uh, and then how do you see this rate play out? Do you see it as what's necessary to keep it going from your perspective? Uh, well, to get to the first question, I think phase six uh, was uh, one of the, the main drivers of this. That was a very expensive phase for an industrial group that was looking for it. Uh, and it was built out to try to satisfy that need that really it sort of started to come to fruition but never came to fruition. So between that whole phase, the plant that was built, uh, it, was <clears throat> it was built for the full build out of that phase, which uh, with all of our industrial users was cut back severely. So that, that's, to me, looking at the whole thing, a big chunk of it is in that phase six part of it. Uh, in terms of meeting with this group, I, you know, thankfully having Tim, Dave, some of the new guys come on, uh, they brought a lot of this stuff to light and their recommendations you know, seem to be right on with what we have to do with these increases, unfortunately. I'm a water sewer user, so <laughs> um, I know what that's going to be. But um, you know, we have been talking about it, and it's, it's unfortunately something that looks like it's it's coming to fruition. So it's just another manifestation, in some ways, of, of the town of Hopkinton and and how we sort of live and work here in 2019. We're primarily a residential community, 84%. and what we work towards, what the chamber work towards, and everybody work towards, are bringing in commercial you know, activity is hard to get done for lots of different reasons because we're primarily a residential community. And this is another piece of that sort of pain of living in a primarily residential community. You know, if we had lots of big industrial users and big malls and things cranking through water and sewer, this would be less painful for us, but we'd also have lots of big industrial users cranking through water and sewer, you know? So it's, it, it, there's, a, there's a cultural thing that we're talking about here, too, in some, in some respects. To put it in perspective, the, the, the plant, uh, the, the cost of the phasing was about $14 million, and it was, could be expanded to 300,000 uh, usage if everybody was to come on, and we're only doing about 57,000 right now. Yeah, so someday that will likely catch up, but it, I, I still think it's a bit of a, a lifestyle thing for us as a community, too. Well, we're, a, we're, excuse me, I'm sorry, we're between a rock and a hard place, too, if I understand it right, because we're not sending anything to Milford, which is the really expensive plant to go to, uh, because we're not using so much 
in the industrial area. And if we start using it more in the industrial area, we're going to have to open that up to Milford again, possibly. It is a possibility, yeah. I mean, when we look for and that's a very expensive possibility, so. Right. If I may, through the chair, to follow on uh, what you just mentioned, it's not only uh, the great management of the team to make sure that we don't have to send the flow to Milford, but the town invested in the upgrade of the sewer line on Elm Street to allow the flow from the South Street and West Main Street area to go down to Wood Street. And the town also invested in the upgrade of the Wood Street sewer pump station so that we're able to send the majority of the flow in this past year, all the flow, to Westboro and Fruit Street. We didn't have to go through the town of Milford. So those were wise investments. Okay. Just from a, sir, from a risk perspective, Mr. Chairman, the, the, uh, this is unique for us, I, I think, that we were uniquely exposed by having a very small handful of users who dominated this enterprise. We don't have a small number of people who own all the property the way uh, you know somebody with a big giant manufacturing plant would. Mm -hmm. We don't have a certain number of people paying all the personal property taxes. We're pretty well diversified across the board with the exception of the sewer system which was built out to serve a very small number mm -hmm. of users who have then curtailed use. Yep. So it's, I, I don't expect a series of these things to happen to us. This isn't like when the Bass Shoe Company closes a factory in Maine and the whole town shuts mm -hmm. down. This was just a unique risk we had because of the nature of the use. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming in. Yeah. One more aspect. All right. Water. 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 Very quickly. 45 minutes late. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, through the chair. Different tone, different tone at this point. Uh, the current financial position of the water enterprise is satisfactory for the levels of revenues that are predicted. That is the current. Looking f into the future, the projected financial position is fair. You can see the drop from satisfactory to fair uh, for the level of revenues projected. What does this mean? The current revenue is sufficient to cover both operating and debt expenses in the immediate future. And there's a healthy retained earnings balance of approximately one million. That is not the case in the near future. The major element of the current enterprise strength comes from the connection fees, estimated to be 513,000 in FY20, 656,000 in 21, and 609,000 in FY22. And this is largely through legacy farms. But the projection that those fees will taper off dramatically in FY23, when construction starts winding down at legacy farms, and eventually drop to about $100,000, uh, which will be a significant loss of revenue for the system. Overall, the revenue is expected to cover operating and capital costs in FY20, as I said, but in FY21, we will begin a series of annual deficits that will begin eating into retained earnings without some rate adjustment. The main factors driving this situation in FY21 and beyond include the following inflationary increases. Number two, expected loss of connection fees at legacy funds. Number three, new borrowing that is expected to spike debt costs in FY23 to 27, just as our connection fees are tempering off or tempering down, tailing off. Um, so again, healthy for now, fair in the future, but this will require rate adjustments. Okay. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much. You got anything else? If, if you may, Chair, John will speak to what is the service that people are purchasing through the enterprise. Right. And then Tim would walk you through. So, okay, so hold on a second. So they want to do a whole other presentation on the water side. Yeah. But aren't we going to do that at the yeah, public hearing? On the 25th? Yeah. I mean, I think we get it now. We, the sewer was the pain. This is like, whatever, we'll figure it out. Yeah. We really need to do that tonight, guys. I'm going to ask the same questions. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So like, I think we can pass on the presentation if that's okay. You just kind of get the maybe some comments. Is exactly. that okay? That's fine. Yep. That's fine. Got any questions? I don't have any questions on the water side. There you go. No water's looking. Okay. It looks good. Water's much more stable. 
They're from all set. All right. See how easy that was? There you go. We have an open book. <laughs> so a similar sheet of water. water. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll share it with you, and you can play for the out years. But great. it's not nothing to lose sleep over. Right. Having the active is just great. Mr. Hurt, thank great. you for reading my level of frustration. <laughs> we just have a lot on our plate, guys. So that was very good on sewer. Yep. Wow. Great presentation. Yep. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to circle back to the change of manager for Zios. Uh, they're not here. Um, so I guess I will entertain a motion to uh, probably not approve uh, changing the manager. Um, if I may, um, a couple of points. One, Paul Winchman is a known quantity. Um, what? Is a, is a known quantity. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, um, he has been before the board several times. We've done the due diligence in the office. Um, however, I also see the, the flip side where usually the board would like to see the manager face to face and share yeah. your expectations. So yeah. perhaps one way forward is to uh, continue this issue to the board's next meeting. Mr. Chair. Yes. Was the applicant uh, informed of the a meeting this evening and the time and all that? Yes. And was he informed that it would be good if you were to show or no? I th he, if I if may check the email, I, I think Maria's emails are pretty clear. I don't recall ever doing a change of manager without having the applicant here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I, I may be wrong, but I don't recall that. Because we typically will say, these were our expectations. I mean, Paul knows that, but I still don't, I don't know if it's a good idea to make a change of manager without yeah. looking him in the eyes. Yeah. I'm not And she is the manager, Kimberly. She His is, wife. but changing it to Paul. Yeah. yeah. So I'm definitely not comfortable moving forward with it without him being here. If our past practice says that we're supposed to, that we would wait for them and, and postpone it a meeting, I'm, I, I'm, I guess I'm all right with that. But um, I also find it a little bit off-putting that if this is a, you know, this is his business and this is something that's important to him, he probably could have driven the three miles. There's not a lot of traffic right now on East Main Street coming up from from his place of business and we've held it we've held it for an hour and a half for him and he hasn't been here so he hasn't told us that he wasn't going to come um he you know the town put a lot of work and effort into letting him know that this is when it's going to be and uh, i find it kind of off-putting almost like a slap in the face that he's not here so do the chair yes sir um, I'm also noticing, I, I don't think his paperwork's in order. Um, the corporate vote is authorizing to appoint, um, to appoint Kimberly Wincham to be the liquor license manager. He has it wrong. This does not require a vote, Mr. Basically, Chair, to postpone yeah. to a future meeting, so I think we should just go ahead and do it. Yeah. By your decree. Uh, the how are we looking on our? As the parliamentarian, I'm just throwing that out there. So I know that there's <laughs> other stuff going on with this. You know, I know that this is just at face value. That that there's there's reasons for this. But how's our next meeting looking, time-wise? I believe because I'm not willing to bend and I'm not willing to, to squeeze this guy into the next meeting if he didn't have the common courtesy to let us know he wasn't coming in. Yeah. So I know that our next meeting, I believe, is the 25th. After that, we're down to one a month. Um, so we're not going to, I don't want to throw it on our next meeting if, if our meeting is heavy. And if water and sewer are on our next meeting, I can tell you that <laughs> the chair is not going to allow 25 minutes for that on the agenda. The chair is going to allow an hour and 45 minutes. So um, that's going to continue to put them off and put them off and put them off. And I don't know if that's going to run into problems with what's going on, stuff that we're not going to talk about. I believe we'll find a way to accommodate the, this item. For the 25th? Yes. So like I said, I'm not comfortable moving other people out to fit him in. I'm sure you guys can figure that out offline. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. if you decide not to put it on the 25th, you make that decision. That's right. 
All right. So, uh, what do you want to move to postpone it to a future? Yes. We don't have to move it. You just you don't have to do job. anything. All right. Just do it. Take okay. no action. Take no action. So, town manager report. Yeah, quickly, um, based on COVID response yet, we're continuing our conversations with st with the state regarding the additional one million dollar funding. Um, we've also hired an appraiser. Um, they have begun their work. We are wrapping up discussions to have somebody come on board as a temporary paralegal to execute the temporary easements. Uh, we have also communicated to MassDOT that part of value engineering this project will entail going back to the um, reduced scope. Um, and we're also working hard to bring in somebody to do the title searches. Okay. And then 45 East Main Street, good news. The RFP is now posted. Um, we have to comply with the state regulations regarding posting of this type of, uh, uh, of, of a project. Okay. Um, the next issue is the... When it says so, I realize Brian was sitting right, right here. So just go in order, if you would, and then I'll get performance up. Performance evals. Yeah, performance evals. We've begun the process. We are really shooting at uh, concluding this exercise uh, by end of this month, uh, and so I'll be coming back with the board to discuss the results of the evaluations. Health insurance. Health insurance. Um, as as in past years, we worked hard. Um, achieved a 0.37% increase over the current, which was substantially lower than the 6.9 that TAFs were asking for. Um, we're also happy that with the new provider, we're changing providers to Always Health Partners. To who? Always Health Partners. Always Health? Yes. And with that as a partnership, we are bringing additional benefits to the employees. Okay. Yeah. So on uh, the next... I do I don't want we have Mr. Hurst step out. I'm out. Beat it. All right, Hopkin and Marathon School Solar Project. Yes, um, we pursuant the board's vote from the last meeting, we've continued as staff supported by town council to negotiate with Solat, specifically on two things. One, we have a site control agreement in place. I'm ready to sign that. Just wanted to let the board know that we've moved that ball forward. And then secondly, we're also finalizing our negotiations on the PPA. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Is that it? That's it. Mr. Herr, come on back. <laughs> Liaison reports. Mr. Catino. I, I have none. No? Mr. Nasser. Well, uh, I went to the Affordable Housing Committee meeting, but we already heard about it. Okay. The very beginning. So, uh, Mary Jo, in these two weeks, have you had time to come across and check in with any of your brand new liaisons? Uh, ac reports? Actually, um, I haven't, but I did. I have been at the Marathon Fund Committee meeting for my last meeting, and I have to tell you, they are going to have a terrific. Uh, piece for the for the town Good. Uh, what they're doing and everything they're, they're putting together a really nice piece uh, Mia is Mina is helping them with it and it's gonna look great when they're done they're awesome. working on it for the summer. Well, we were at the closing ceremonies together for the uh, marathon yeah yeah we were at that <laughs> all right mr. Hurd you don't have any I have nothing to report all right, future board agenda items. Anybody? I'm good. Can't say parking anymore. Hey. Okay. Well, yeah, we, well, until we get it. Okay. Is All right, so I'll we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We have signatures? Yes, we do. So moved. moved. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? See you later. Keeping See you next moving. week. See you two weeks.